Ecology or Catastrophe, The Life of Murray Bookchin, by Janet Beale, published by Oxford University Press, 2015. Chapter 3, Rethinker in 1947 to 50 some two dozen people read capitalist barbarism or socialism rallied to its retrogression thesis and joined the new group to publish contemporary issues ci most were former trotskyists some came from labor zionism and all wanted a new socialist movement to emerge from the magazine's discussions one that would offer a democratic solution to the crisis of mankind joseph weber named that movement in advance of its birth, the movement for a democracy of content. The meaning of democracy of content would never be entirely clear, except that it differed from formal democracy, a mere set of rules and procedures for decision-making. A democracy of content would involve ends, not just means, ethics, not just instrumental procedures. It would become the living model for the transformation of the whole of society. How would the movement be structured? Under capitalism, Weber warned, most organizations, even the best intentioned, alienate themselves from their original aim and develop a bureaucracy that becomes an end in itself. Such creeping normalization ruins movements and bolsters up the system. The movement for a democracy of content, as Weber had it in mind, would issue any such leadership apparatus in favor of a simple and clear democratic structure, so that even if thousands of unprepared people entered, it would remain transparent to and controllable by all. The movement would certainly not form a traditional political party because all parties are no good. Members of the CI group would take on no specialized roles, every member would be simultaneously editor, theorist, propagandist, correspondent, organizer, secretary, proofreader, and typist. Two friends in London organized the printing and paid the bills, but no CI members would be paid for their movement work, since paychecks would lead to a new commerce in commodities, and the movement must remain outside the capitalist economy. Weber attracted members to CI with the content of his ideas but also with his personal charm, an unusual trait in so committed a revolutionary. Weber was almost always smiling, full of fun, wrote one CI ear fond of telling jokes, easy to talk to, affectionate, physical. The absolute opposite of what I expected a German intellectual to be. He not only didn't brood or exhibit melancholy, he thought very little of those who did. He had a piano in the living room, which he played often and well. Weber embraced what he called Pantagruelism, derived from the writings of the 16th century French novelist Rabelais, who had written Gargantua and Pantagruel as an act of rebellion against medieval Catholicism. This work depicts life in the Abbey of Thelemae, an anarchic utopia whose residents are not ruled by laws but live according to their own free will and pleasure, following only one rule, do what thou wilt. That arrangement works, in Rabelais' novels, because in honest companies people have naturally an instinct that prompteth them unto virtuous actions, and withdraws them from vice. Pantagruelism thus involves a passionate love of life, a libertine zest, and an exuberant faith in human goodness. Pantagruelists follow their instincts, seeking satisfaction for the body in physical pleasure and for the mind in the delights of curiosity and study. Pantagruelism was also potentially an engine of the socialist revolutionary project as a principle of rebellion, the disastrous nature of capitalism was obvious, and the awakening Jacques sooner or later must ask, why should we continue to be your slaves, and why should you wish to remain our masters if there is more than enough for all of us? Weber deeply admired Denis Diderot's novel Jacques L.E. Fatalist, 1773-75, which he considered a Pantagruelist masterpiece. The protagonist, Jacques, is a man of uninhibited sexuality who considers even monogamy to be thoroughly hypocritical and untenable. For Jacques, the adulterer is the true moralist, for every healthy man and woman is an adulterer, if not in flesh, the more frequently in thought. But Weber put aside wit and sensuality when it came to Richard Viogenier whom he revered, his physical resemblance to the 19th-century German composer extended to a personal identification. 
In 1944 he had even presumed to write a revised scenario for the Ring of the Nibelungen, which he self-commended as superior to the original, Wagner intended the same thing as the writer of these lines, only he was, alas, just Richard Wagner and not the writer of these lines. Yes, as Murray told me, Weber had a bloated conception of his own genius. He had a strong concept, too, of his own crucial role in revolutionary politics, and the movement for a democracy of content agreed, said the London group, Jupp Weber is our absolute spiritual leader. As strong as his self-image was, Weber was physically frail. By 1947 he had had several heart attacks. Soon after the second issue of CI was published, he had another one and spent two months in a hospital. Still, his frailty evoked sympathy and brought out the group's solicitude and protectiveness toward him. Almost every evening Bookchin would visit Weber's apartment to help him with his research and writing, learn from him, and revel in the companionship of a towering intellect with great political experience on two continents. As CI began publishing, Weber's typewriter churned out a stream of articles, manifestos, editorials, analyses, replies to critics, replies to readers. He would write in German first, then read off a translation to Bookchin, who transcribed it. I helped him clarify his thoughts, he told me. Bookchin would then edit it, revise it, and type up the final version. His mentor's writing, Bookchin thought, was luminescent. C.I. was, in effect, Bookchin's graduate school. He soaked up everything Weber had to offer, especially concerning Hegelian philosophy and socialist theory and German revolutionary history. Weber taught him, for example about the interwar Marxian crisis theorists, who had tried to prove that capitalism must inevitably collapse. Even his errors were brilliant, Murray once told me. Their intellectual and political relationship soon became personal as well, at 26, Murray had finally found a father figure. He abjectly adored Weber. And when he began writing his own articles for CI, he wrote for the purpose of advancing Weber's work. As a writer and theorist, Weber's immense self-esteem tended to undermine his intellectual rigor. He happily issued ex cathedra assertions and opinions but neglected the hard work of amassing the factual evidence upon which they might be based. So Bookchin stepped in to do the research for him. So when Weber's bombast interfered with his rigor, Bookchin supplied the missing documentation. He learned to be a writer by acting as Weber's bulldog. The CIers met every Friday evening to talk politics. The meetings were of intense intellectual interest, remembered Annette Jacobson. Weber and Bookchin offered brilliant illumination of past and current world events and topical issues. Murray had a phenomenal knowledge of history, recalled Rennie Bob. When he disagreed with someone, recalled Jacobson, he was magnanimous and reasonable. He would expound, might illustrate tangentially, and like Joe, offer enlightenment in a kind way. Members clashed sometimes, there was often heated argument at meetings, recalled Bob. So Weber laid down a rule, group discourse had to be civil. The democracy of content stood for non-barbarism, i.e., for a civilized discussion even with opponents. Discussion should be constructive, avoiding personal sharpness. Least of all should members engage in what Weber called venom and gall, or gratuitous vituperation. I take great care, in questions of judgment, Weber explained, not to allow feelings to be roused at all. The CIers socialized together. Bookchin's closest friends were Dave Eisen, his old SWP buddy, and Jack and Mina Grossman. In 1951 Bookchin married Beatrice Appelstein, whom he brought into CI and who became a good comrade, Murray told me. The group collectively edited the magazine, which appeared regularly. To build the movement for a democracy of content, we tried to approach people based on their immediate interests, Jack Grossman told me. All efforts to retard the tendency to barbarism were worthwhile. Weber's career in Europe, with the International Communists of Germany, IKD, underground and in exile had taught him to be secretive, and he retained that trait in New York, at his insistence, 
the articles that he and other CIers wrote were published in the magazine under cryptonyms. Weber's articles appeared under the names Ernst Zander, William Lunan, and Eric Erickson, Book Chin wrote as M. S. Shiloh, Robert Keller, Harry Ludd, and Lewis Herber. The first issues, 1948-50, focused intensively on retrogression in all its aspects. Led by Weber, the CIers considered Stalinist Russia to be the acme of retrogression. CIers called it Russia rather than the Soviet Union. Stalin's totalitarian state has not the slightest connection with socialism or communism, the workers were in control of nothing. Rather, it was state capitalist, a combination of capitalist organization and state ownership. As such, it waged a ceaseless civil war against its own population. Stalin's regime was more belligerent, more rapacious, murderous, and ruthless than the most savage of other imperialisms. In 1950 Bookchin wrote his first published article called State Capitalism in Russia, bylined M. S. Shiloh, to substantiate Weber's assertion and affirm his conclusions. Russia, he wrote, embodied capitalist retrogression in every feature. Workers, technicians, and engineers were enslaved to the state, toiling in the bleak hells of Siberia, in mines, and on wastes where life is scarcely maintainable and quickly passes out of existence. The system's absolute foundation was arms production, which was also the life fluid of capitalism. Over and over again, Weber would make an observation, and then Bookchin would scour newspapers and books to document it. Like an eager graduate student, he did Weber's homework for him with energy and enthusiasm. Weber had said that Stalinist Russia was the most violent, bloody, and reactionary inquisition and barbarism that ever existed in history surpassing even Hitler's Germany. So Bookchin echoed that Stalinist Russia today assumes the functions of Hitler during the 30s. Weber laid down ideas, and Bookchin echoed them, sometimes to the point of recklessness, when Weber wrote that Stalin killed more Jews than Hitler, Stalin again takes the lead, Bookchin echoed that German fascism showed more hesitation in the application of repressive measures than Russian fascism. Bookchin later regretted that he had downplayed the level of popular anti-Semitism in the Third Reich and excessively blamed Stalin for the annihilation of Europe's Jews. Still, in the 1950s he was right to raise the alarm about the threat of Russian anti-Semitism, correctly noting that the Kremlin has singled out the Jewish people for discrimination and liquidation. Stalin was, in fact, in those years accusing prominent Russian Jewish doctors of plotting against him. Decades later, documents from the Stalin archive would confirm that plans like those Bookchin described in the early 1950s had been underway, had Stalin not died when he did, Russian Jews would have undergone another holocaust. Besides Stalin's Russia, retrogression's other great bastion was the United States, the very acme of capitalist barbarism. Some might have thought that the United States was a lesser evil than Stalinist Russia, but the devil can't be driven out with Beelzebub, Weber said. Indeed, the incipient Cold War was a mere sham, the two regimes were actually collaborating to impose retrogression, to reduce Germany to colonial status, and to drive the world toward an international slave order, ruled by a few monopoly capitalists. Soon it would bring about general crises, annihilation of nations and expulsion of peoples in peacetime, deportations, civil war, colonial oppression, in short, the decisive ruin of mankind. Bookchin did the research on American retrogression as well. The germs of totalitarianism, he wrote, were rotting the core of American democratic life and rolling out the carpet for American fascism. McCarthyism was one symptom. Congressional committees and loyalty boards, he wrote in 1953, have constituted themselves into a permanent, quasi-court system with fantastic prerogatives, and a court procedure that is completely alien to the constitutional guarantees of the country. The House Un-American Activities Committee was duplicating the step-by-step -step march towards totalitarianism in Europe. Weber was much impressed by Bookchin's work. So sometime in the early 1950s, he bestowed on him a great honor, he designated him as his heir, the Engels to his marks. Murray must have been elated. 
Although Weber and the CI group rejected Marxism, they did not throw it entirely into the dustbin. They especially admired the dialectical philosophy that underlay it and sought to rescue it for C's rethinking. Weber introduced the CI group to the writings of the Frankfurt School, a kind of Marxist think tank, formally called the Institute for Social Research, or ISR, that had fled Germany in 1935 for New York. Weber held the ISR intellectuals in high esteem, they rank in knowledge of the social process far above any of their contemporary colleagues. The Frankfurt schoolers, like the CIers, had been grappling with the era's compelling questions, why had the proletariat failed to fulfill its historic role and create a socialist revolution? Why had fascism arisen instead? Their most basic and most intriguing answer, as recounted in Herbert Marcuse's Reason and Revolution, published 1941, and Max Horkheimer's Eclipse of Reason, 1947, was that reason had been degraded into an instrument for domination. In pre-modern times, they argued, reason had been infused with many excellent qualities, reflection, speculation, discernment, judgment, and critique. It had been concerned with content, not form, with ends, not means, and above all with ethics. In a word, it had been dialectical. But the Enlightenment had separated means from ends, form from content, and reduced reason to procedure, utility, and calculation, a tool for manipulation and domination. This process of immoral instrumentalization had culminated in the cold efficiency and technical precision of Nazi Germany's mass exterminations. After the war, the nexus of instrumental reason had shifted to the United States, as was manifested in its prevailing philosophical currents, positivism, and empiricism. To Weber and Bookchin, instrumental reason, as described by the Frankfurt School, was yet another symptom of retrogression. Both were fascinated by the concept of dialectical reason. As a philosophy of organic development, it describes the processes of separation and incorporation that propel a development forward, that which exists, that which contradicts it, and the new transformative product of their interaction that preserves what is valuable in both. It looks both forward and back. But dialectical reason, ethically charged as it was, could also be a tool to judge and critique the existing society against an ethical standard. Using standards deriving from ethics-infused dialectical reason, one could also affirm the potentialities within the existing corrupt society for the creation of a rational society. In this connection, dialectical philosophy had yet another, more personal appeal for Bookchin and Weber, it was a study in alienation. It gave the two men, both of whom had been dislocated by history, albeit in different ways, a framework to criticize the barbaric, retrogressive American what is and thereby discern the possibility of a rational what could be. By upholding ethics against instrumentalism, dialectical critique was part of the revolutionary process. Simply by engaging in critical discourse the CIers were helping to drive revolutionary change forward. That said, Weber's interpretation of dialectics turned out to be somewhat idiosyncratic, even crude. He used it to construct a literal analogy between capitalism and organic growth. Like a plant or an animal, he said, capitalism had been born, it grew up, it became mature, and now it was rotting, and one day it would die. Retrogression was the putrefaction of capitalism, a quasi-biological inevitability. But where Weber used dialectics to brood about decline and rot, Bookchin picked up on the Frankfurt School's more sophisticated idea of using ethically charged dialectical reason for critique. Capitalism, deploying instrumental reason, measures value in terms of potential profits and reduces objects to commodities. It strips social life of meaning and content, reducing people to disconnected, competitive individuals. A competitive industrial spirit now permeates nearly every aspect of American life. Similarly the bureaucratic state reduces people once members of a community to atoms, to units, mere statistics in a dominating system. But writers who offered a dialectical critique could inspire an ethical revolt against capitalism and the state, against commodification and bureaucracy. By showing them an alternative to what is, 
the ethical what could be, they could spur people to rebel against their own dehumanization. Knowing they had a choice, people could and would choose ethics over instrumentalism, cooperation over competition, morality over manipulation, content over form, and face-to-face -face interaction over bureaucracy. Where Marxian socialism had claimed to be scientific, the new socialism would be drenched in an ethical dimension. Weber scoffed at his protege's ideas about ethics. You can't depend on virtue to bring about social change, he said. That was only another commodity among innumerable sham products. The idea that we need a morality is a deceptive abstraction. All that mattered was the materialistic point of view. Perhaps to address this objection, Bookchin acknowledged that people were not going to make an ethical revolt out of the blue, some crisis in capitalism, some systemic breakdown, would also have to propel them. That a crisis is inevitable no longer is doubted, he wrote. The only question is when it will come and, above all, how it will be managed. The nature of the crisis was still unclear, but whenever it came, people would and could choose to dispense with the irrational society of capitalism in favor of an ethical, rational society, one based on use instead of profit, on cooperation instead of competition, on reason instead of demoniacal blindness. Even as Weber and the CI group were pondering retrogression, the American, British and French authorities occupying Germany were having second thoughts about the Morgenthau Plan, the decision to dismantle Germany's industrial infrastructure and reduce the country to farmland. Deindustrialization was turning out to be too harsh a program on the German people, and if their hunger and poverty became too extreme, they might turn communist. So in late 1946-47 the Truman administration set aside the Morgenthau Plan and instead affirmed that an orderly prosperous Europe requires the economic contributions of a stable and productive Germany. The Marshall Plan was, in effect, a reversal of the Morgenthau Plan. Over the next years, the United States would pour billions of dollars into Europe, not to ruralize it but to rebuild its industrial plant. That material assistance would help West Germany grow at the astonishing rate of 8% per year throughout the 1950s. By 1960 its gross national product, GNP, would be second in the world, behind only that of the United States. Instead of retrogressing, West Germany would undergo an economic miracle. As for Japan, instead of turning the Japanese into slaves, the United States imposed a democratic constitution on the country. Domestically, the United States did not relapse back into economic depression. On the contrary it entered a period of unprecedented prosperity. Americans were buying cars and moving to the suburbs. By 1950 Bookchin understood that American industry was facing, not a contraction, but a seemingly limitless expansion. Weber's retrogression thesis turned out to be thoroughly and profoundly false. Weber, however, could not or would not bring himself to admit it. And in deference to their mentor, CI ears held their tongues, uncomfortably. Sometime around 1951 Bookchin and another CI ear Leon Brownstein, got up the nerve to confront him. As tactfully as they could, they asked Weber how his thesis could still be viable when the economy was so clearly booming. Weber wagged his finger at them and said, wait. You'll see. The retrogression thesis had been C's unifying idea, and with its failure, CI members had every reason to leave the group, it might well have disbanded. At this time, owing in great part to the McCarthyite Red Scare, the American left as a whole was shriveling. Once numerous radical bookstores were shuttered, leftist publishers went out of business, and public forums vanished. One-time socialists and communists, like Felix Morrow, found careers in mainstream institutions. But the CI group persisted. In fact, its members not only stayed together, they began meeting twice a week instead of once, adding Saturdays to the regular Friday meetings. The members would continue to meet to talk about politics and philosophy and edit the magazine, for the rest of the decade. Why? One reason was surely their respect for Weber. The worldly European socialist, born in the country of Karl Marx, 
still had a charismatic pull on them, and Book Chin found himself unable to resist that revolutionary prestige. Even after Weber ceased to be his mentor, Book Chin deferred to him reflexively as a result of the psychological bond. Many of the group members too were emotionally attached to him, regarding him as their second father, as Rennie Bob recalled, or maybe first, in the case of Book Chin, who didn't have a father. These earnest young people also felt strongly connected to one another. I believe the group stayed together out of comradeship, recalled Annette Jacobson, and a bonding because of common personal values and philosophic principles. Over 60 years later, she still recalled fondly the atmosphere of respect, friendship, and amazing camaraderie. Finally, retrogression or no, the CIRs shared the conviction that the only alternative to socialism was barbarism, and that barbarism, no matter how economically comfortable was intolerable. Capitalist America might be prosperous, but it still was instrumental, and it still commodified all aspects of life. Weber had laid down the marker in 1950, if we fail to transform the capitalist mode of production into a socialist mode, barbarism assumes the sharply delineated outlines for the doom of all modern society. Even if everyone else in the United States conformed to the culture of barbarism, the CIRs would stand tall and refuse. So they continued with their common project, the magazine, in which they studied possible sources of new social conflict. They viewed every social problem as a manifestation of capitalist irrationality, and they sought to tie all solutions to specific ills to a general opposition to the system as a whole. Not only did they stay with CI, they made personal sacrifices to do so. Instead of going to graduate or professional schools, these articulate, by now well-read people took sometimes menial jobs so that they could remain part of the group. Book Chin got a job at the welfare department as a bookkeeper. Murray Bob worked for a shipping company. Chet Manes, who had been in the SWP minority, worked as a janitor. Jack Grossman was a structural steel detailer. None of them had much money. As for Weber, he initially was funded by Vincent Swart, the CI Project's London-based financier, but at some point that funding dried up. CIER Chet Manes took a second job, as a night janitor in a school near his home, so he could turn those paychecks over to Weber. He didn't mind, it was a privilege, an honor to support his mentor, he was just doing what Engels had done for Marx. As Book Chin and Weber rethought the revolutionary project, they sorted through their old Marxist ideas to salvage whatever might still be illuminating or useful. One thing they rescued, as we have seen, was dialectical philosophy, another was Marx's view of technology, the means of production. Marx had considered it capitalism's historical mission to develop technology to the point where it could provide for humanity's material needs. In recent centuries, technological advances, from the steam engine to the factory system to steel production, had been so immense that onerous toil could, in principle be eliminated. Machines could perform the grueling physical work that people had once done. Once technology reached the point of automation, capitalism would have no further basis for existence, and the apparatus could pass into the hands of the workers, who could use it to create socialism. Even before the war, Trotsky had thought the United States, having reached the highest stage of technological development, was ripe for socialist revolution and socialism, more ripe than any other country in the world. Now, in the post-war era, even further technological advances were underway, the preconditions were more than ripe. But all this technology was still in the wrong hands, and so it was being used, not for socialism, but to intensify want and exploitation transfer it to the people's hands, and they could use it to eliminate toil and gain the leisure time to develop their creative sides. Book Chin attended the RCA Institute on the GI Bill, where he not only got his high school equivalency degree but studied electronic engineering, these latter classes reinforced his view that machines could ultimately replace most human toil. To a man who had once done hard labor in a foundry, that notion was positively utopian. In the late 1940s, several thinkers were arguing that the new technologies were opening up utopian possibilities. 
Max Horkheimer and Eric Fromm, both of the Frankfurt School, agreed that the present potentialities of social development surpassed the dreams and visions of all previous utopias. The anarchist Paul Goodman's 1947 book Communitas offered plans for utopias in cities. In this vein, Weber, hoping to provide a new platform for the CI group, wrote a manifesto that he called the Great Utopia. For millennia, he argued, humanity's dreams of achieving paradise had remained at the level of fantasy, because people had been required to toil to meet their basic material needs. Now technology had progressed to the point that it could provide for those needs, in superfluity. Hence the potentiality exists for humankind to finally be liberated from the burden of onerous physical labor and to be free to devote most of their time to creativity and enjoyment. At present this technology is being used to manufacture endless consumer goods to satiate artificially contrived needs. To channel its use to utopian ends, society must eliminate wasteful production and instead produce goods of quality that meet real needs, that is, society must produce not for profit but for use. Since the material conditions for such a rational society exist, said Weber, there is nothing in principle to obstruct the solution to the social question. Humanity must simply decide to do it. It must make that choice by democratic majority decision. The vehicle for doing so was the open, transparent movement for a democracy of content. He appealed to readers to join the movement, in ever greater numbers, until the party is the people and the people is the party. Once enough people joined, they could seize control of technology and economic life. To attract the public, Weber thought, CI needed to develop a specific practical plan for converting the wasteful present-day economy to a popularly controlled utopia. The CI group, he said, must undertake a detailed inventory of all of America's economic and social resources, then distinguish what was socially useful from what was socially wasteful. The group would then be able to demonstrate concretely that after eliminating what was wasteful, society could be organized rationally to satisfy everyone's basic needs. Once CI placed this plan before the public, citizens would recognize it as a good idea and rush to join. Developing this world plan, as Weber came to call it, would be a huge task, it would first require analyzing the U.S. national budget, as a reflection of the national wealth. But making it happen became his priority. Not that he would undertake the job himself, he never did care to do his own research. The whole group, or perhaps a few members, could do it. But as much as Weber urged them, the group found the task so huge as to be daunting. No one, it seems, volunteered. Weber who had crossed an ocean to escape the Nazis, had no love for his new place of refuge. He had adored living in Paris, but he actively despised New York. Not least of his discontents was the food. The Coca-Cola and the hot dogs, even the mustard, were nauseating, my stomach revolts. Most foodstuffs were bland and processed, in New York I have never eaten a true vegetable or fruit or chicken or pork chop. The canned peas and carrots were particularly loathsome instances of American culinary retrogression. In 1948 two books appeared that, to Weber, began to explain what was wrong with American food. Fairfield Osborne's Our Plundered Planet, published in 1948, documented that since the war's end, a new chemical industry had emerged. Industrialized agriculture was now routinely spraying pesticides onto crops and spreading fertilizers and herbicides into soil. These petrochemicals were being touted as miraculous, better things for better living through chemistry as DuPont put it. But the chemicals were causing an upswing in cancer rates, Osborne asserted. The other book, William Votes the Road to Survival, contended that the rapacious capitalist system, in its quest for profit, was rendering North America, one of the Earth's wealthiest and most fertile regions, sterile. It was exhausting topsoil and leveling forests and exterminating fauna. Both books were pleas for conservation and better human management of the natural environment. You could see the problem with industrially produced foodstuffs, Weber thought, in the bad taste of many American fruits, vegetables, and meats. 
chemical fertilizers not only reduced their nutritional value but, as Osborne argued, were responsible for the appalling increase in the incidence of heart maladies cancer and other modern plagues. So enamored was Weber of this thesis that he asked CIER Phil McDougall to review the two books for the magazine. McDougall did so, writing that the picture that Osborne and Voke painted was indeed frightening, the loss of arable land and topsoil constituted the most immediate single threat to civilization. But he disagreed with Weber's view that chemicals were so toxic that they should be banned altogether. Inorganic fertilizers could actually be a boon, McDougall said, they replenished played out soil and increased its bounty. He favored their proper use. Weber had hoped for an endorsement of his own thinking and was annoyed by the review. As for the rest of the CI group, they were perplexed. Osborne and Voke made a compelling and persuasive case but they had trouble accepting it because Weber himself was undermining it. He insisted on associating it with the ideas of one Bernard Ashner, an unconventional Viennese practitioner whom he admired. Ashner thought cancer could be caused not only by chemicals but by physical blows, love bites, hysterectomy, and even personal appearance. We know that cancer families are usually black-haired. The group saw right away that Ashner was a quack, a mystical crackpot. Weber's using him as a source distorted whole the issue of environmental destruction. To achieve some clarity Weber called for an investigation into the matter. His protege and heir Book Chin, who was as puzzled as anyone, rose to the challenge, as he had so often done before. Just at that moment, in the fall of 1950, a U.S. Congressional Committee was holding hearings on the subject of chemicals in food. The committee's final report, issued in 1952, concluded that chemical additives in food raised a serious problem as far as the public health is concerned. As he combed through the transcript, Book Chin learned that parathion, DDT, chlordane, diethylstilbestrol, in other words, fertilizers, pesticides, preservatives, and flavoring and coloring agents, have potentially devastating effects on the human body. These chemicals, he wrote in a long article produce abnormalities in the organism as a whole that can disrupt cellular structure, from which processes cancer may emerge. The problem of chemicals in food was published in CI in 1952. Weber must have been pleased that his protege and heir had vindicated him, about the carcinogens if not about Ashner. But this time Bookchin had not simply done Weber's homework, he realized that the subject had enormous implications, that the adulteration of food was part of the misuse of industry as a whole. Capitalism was reshaping agriculture. To maximize profits, industrial agriculture was cultivating crops on a large scale in monocultures which required pesticides because they were vulnerable to infestations and fertilizers because they degraded soil. Chemicalization was part of the instrumentalization of food production, which commodified both farming and gustation. Capitalism as a system, it turned out, was harmful to human health and well-being. The very concept, Bookchin recognized, was explosive. True to its original promises, the pages of CI remained open to discussion. Letters from readers were welcomed and published, even hostile ones. Weber took responsibility for answering them, albeit in verbose rambling replies. Sometimes he violated the rules of civility that he had laid down at the outset. When someone criticized the great utopia as old stuff and warmed up wisdom, he lashed back with a bitterly sarcastic piece called The Dog Behind the Stove, written partly in verse, Look at my cur. He barked, the lout, utopia? That's old shit. But when I kick him on its snout, he yelps devoid of wit. He appeared not to care that his arrogant, contemptuous style might have a chilling effect on future letter writers. In fact, he relished being able to finish somebody off artistically and in a satirical manner. After all, misplaced modestly cannot prevent us, meaning himself, from affirming that we are extremely interesting. In 1953 Weber had had another heart attack, which left him less able to manage his temper. Now whenever someone irritated him, he confessed to a friend, that person was in danger of being killed on the spot the heart stops to beat, and I'm for a moment simply not there. 
then I feel the blood roar in my head and all control is lost. Once his heart was stirred up, it remains in an irritated condition for quite some time, affecting me day and night and requiring considerable efforts to get it back to what I can call normal. It didn't help matters that New York's perpetual ding kept him awake at night. While Weber tossed and turned, the elevated trains make noise 200 yards away, motor cars, lorries, buses, aeroplanes make noise, everywhere radios make noise, and again and again one is awakened by voices and sounds like shots. With its clattering and thundering subways and its wailing sirens, New York ground its residents down. It was unwholesome, ugly uninspired, nerve-wracking, crushing, hostile to the sense, hostile to life, a catastrophe, the very embodiment of retrogression, a concept he seemed increasingly willing to rescue by diluting its meaning. Most irritating of all, the CI group was dragging its heels on undertaking the statistical survey of the American economy the all-important world plan. Their delay in giving the matter flesh was causing the blood to roar in his head. Sometime in 1953, he asked his protege and heir to do the job. Probably Book Chin would have preferred to continue researching chemicals in food, but how could he turn down a personal, urgent appeal from his beloved mentor? So he agreed, putting his own project aside. But what an enormous task it was, the ultimate research assignment. Getting down to work, he first made a list of basic human needs, food, clothing, shelter, furnishings, medical care, utilities, water, transportation, energy and so on, then went to the library every day to pour over statistics on the various economic sectors that supplied goods and services to meet those needs. He researched the capacities of factories and distribution facilities. Everywhere he looked he found colossal waste. Raw materials were being squandered. Corporations were producing commodities, in staggering quantities, that were useless or destructive or both. To boost consumer consumption of them, managers mobilized a huge labor force, an oversized army of clerks, accountants, bookkeepers, typists, managers, executives, salesmen, brokers, dealers, engineers, foremen, psychologists, supervisors, advertising specialists and artists. The biggest wastrel of all was the U.S. government itself, which was rolling in unnecessary expenditures. Overall, Bookchin concluded, the present social order, a thoroughly artificial system, could be maintained only because of an exhausting parasitism that, octopus-like, slowly strangles all strata of the population. He wrote up his research, and as he finished each chapter of the world plan, he presented it to the CI group, who discussed it and praised it. The entire document was slated for publication in 1954. On March 1 of that year, the United States tested a hydrogen bomb at Bikini Atoll in the South Pacific. The force of the blast was a thousand times more powerful than the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The wind shifted eastward, blowing the radioactive plume toward a Japanese fishing boat, the Fortunate Dragon. Crew members' skin was blackened and blistered. In September the vessel's radio operator died. The fallout reached Japan, where some dubbed the incident a second Hiroshima. If anything was a contemporary issue, the CI group agreed, it was thermonuclear weapons. Book Chin churned out a pamphlet called Stop the Bomb, demanding an immediate end to the tests, since the fallout they produced could render large parts of our marine food supply radioactive and unhealthful all over the world. Bookchin's leaflet broke new ground by opposing not only these terrifyingly destructive weapons but also the peaceful uses of the atom that the Eisenhower administration was also urging at the time, to generate energy. Atomic power plants, too, he pointed out, would produce radioactivity which could contaminate the food supply and damage health. Radiation, whether generated by bombs or by power plants, was the most lethal of all chemicals in food. CI distributed 20,000 copies of the leaflet around New York, and the response exceeded their wildest expectations. Letters poured in, expressing pleasure at meeting others who oppose this insanity and offering to help the campaign. 
the prominent pacifist A.J. Must told Bookchin personally that the Stop the Bomb leaflet transformed his thinking about nuclear power. The leaflet was widely reprinted. The large Japanese daily Asahi Shimbun published excerpts on page 1. It was a surprise wrote a reader, for us Japanese to know that there are many people also in America who want to stop the A-bomb or the H-bomb. Japanese scientists and intellectuals wrote letters to CI, explaining that even vegetables in this country now are more or less dangerously radioactive, as the Earth itself is fully radioactive. Atmospheric nuclear testing became one of CI's most important topics, the magazine published many articles on the subject between 1954 and 1960. Given the alarming health crises that were emerging, Book Chin found it difficult to concentrate on the world plan. Not only was the statistical work tedious, but the project had come to seem strangely trite. That American capitalism could produce ample resources to go around seemed obvious, even without statistical evidence. And irritatingly the project was quantitative in nature, instrumental, as if achieving utopia were simply a matter of accounting. But you could not simply redistribute wealth to satisfy material needs, Book Chin thought you, would also need an ethical revolt, something Weber refused to admit. The plan seemed more and more like a monumental waste of time. Doggedly loyal to Weber nonetheless, Book Chin wrote a stirring introduction, arguing that the U.S. economy was brimming and overflowing with the means of life. If Americans chose to get rid of the wasteful corporate and governmental bureaucracies, they could achieve the fruition of a rational system. But when he presented the introduction at a group meeting, Weber objected to it, perhaps because Book Chin interjected some lines about ethics. In any case having prodded his protege and heir into writing the world plan, Weber vetoed, for publication in CI, the introduction he had written. The blood in his head must have been roaring something fierce. Book Chin had had enough, he dropped the world plan project. The issue of chemicals in food and nuclear weapons had sparked his thinking in new and creative directions.